Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. be with you. And with your Let us pray. O oh God, your never failing providence sets in order all things both in heaven and on earth. Put away from us all hurtful things and give us those things that are profitable for us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. If among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Take care lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart, and you say, the seventh year, the year of release, is near, and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, and you give him nothing. And he cry to, to the Lord against you, and you be guilty of sin. You shall give to him freely, and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work 
and in all that you undertake. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. The word of the Lord. A reading from Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, 
see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And in this matter I give my judgment, this benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now, finish doing it well, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is suscept acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that, as a matter of fairness, your abundance in the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathers much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out of, from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John and the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means... Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was twelve years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this, and told them to give her something to eat. 
the Holy Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Do not fear, only believe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, in our Gospel lection, we have the text of Jairus and his daughter. As I've, uh, of course, I've read this passage probably hundreds of times in my lifetime, but uh, as I read it this past couple of weeks preparing for this homily, I couldn't but help to read it as a father. And as a father, it completely transformed the way that I read it. And as I looked at Jairus in that context, what I found was uh, someone who was very much like all of us. And Jairus' situation may be an extreme one where things turn out, uh, it would seem at first, absolutely terribly. Nonetheless, that I found that the sort of internal steps that Jairus must be going through in this text are the same sort of turns that we make as well as we are confronted with difficult situations every single day. As we look at Jairus, we see that uh, he had some wrong steps. Either he took the wrong steps or wrong steps were taken upon him. And what we see with Jairus is the wrong questions, the wrong timing, and the wrong outcome. And yet in all of this, God proves faithful. And today I want to take a walk through each of these steps and find where we can see ourselves in the wrong questions, the wrong timing, and the wrong outcomes but yet see how God proves himself faithful to us as well. So first of all, with the wrong question, our text begins like this. He says, Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. As we look at Jairus here, we look at a man who is a father. We can see him coming to Jesus and probably begging. This is a man that is on at the very end of his rope. And I don't know about you, but when I reach the end of my rope, I tend not to be thinking very well. And as one of the things that stuck out to me first as I began looking at this passage is that if we look at the passage as a whole, it turns out that Jairus is asking, first of all, for the wrong thing. Jairus is probably at this point completely unaware of the fact that his, bro- his daughter has likely already died. He does not know what he should ask for. He asks for her to be made well, when what he really ought to be asking for is for her to be restored to life. But then as I thought about that further, I thought to myself, would he have even the boldness or the capacity to even ask for that miracle? Sure, he may have thought of Jesus as a miracle worker, but did he think of Jesus as that much of a miracle worker? It was clearly within the bounds of his expectation that his daughter's health could be restored. But could it possibly be within his expectation that she could be restored to life. I tend to think not. I think that if she had passed away before he had left, he probably would have given up. He probably would have said that it was too late. As I look at Jairus in this situation, I see all of us. How are we any different? How often do we in our troubles and insecurities and difficulties that come to us every single day. Do we really know what it is that we ought to be asking for? 
Do we really know what it is that would actually solve our problems? Or might the actual answers be hidden from us? Not only that, but in the questions that we ask, are we failing to give God his due? Are we underestimating what it is that God could do in our situation simply because we've only begun to ask the wrong questions? And it may begin, made me begin to ask myself, how much anxiety have we endured because we think we need something that we don't actually need? How much sleep have we lost because we are unaware of all that God is capable of? How many hours have we fretted away because we have not even begun to dream of the magnitude of God's greatness and goodness? But yet, despite the fact that Jairus neither knew what it is that he should ask, nor asked for the right thing, nor estimated appropriately what Jesus could do, Nonetheless, none of this stood in the way of Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't need to wait for Jairus to figure it out. Jesus didn't need to wait for Jairus to believe that Jesus could even raise the dead. Jesus jumped straight to action and began to follow. And I believe that Jesus Christ does the same thing for each and every one of us. As a matter of fact, we have the promise that he does. St. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, he says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. As I look at Jairus in this situation, I see that our faith, is grounded in God's ability to do, not in our ability to know what needs to be done. And so Jairus not only asks the wrong questions, but also Jairus finds himself a victim of the wrong timing. As we go on down the passage, we see that their journey is quickly interrupted. It says, And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? Now, for most of my history as a priest, I've just sort of looked at this as sort of a diversion in the text. Uh, Mark just sort of decided to have two miracles in one and sort of sandwich them together, and it's just sort of an interesting uh, construction literarily. But then as I looked at this as a father, I thought to myself, what must Jairus be thinking at this moment? No doubt, he came to Jesus at what he felt must be the last moment. Look at how he phrased his request of Jesus. He said that his daughter is at the point of death. What that means to me is that Jairus has probably been frantically working through his options. He's probably already been from doctor to doctor and doctor to doctor to doctor. I know that as I as a father, would probably leave the miracle worker as my last option. I would have probably gone through every other possible means. This is a man who is absolutely desperate and out of time. And now here they go. They're finally making their way back to his daughter. And what happens? They run into a massive crowd. There's a traffic jam. People are bumbling up against one another. They can hardly even take a step. Can you imagine what Jairus feels in that moment? In that moment where you just can't move quickly enough, where you just can't even get there in time, can you imagine the anxiety that's rising in his heart? And then Jesus has the audacity to stop and start a conversation with the crowd. Who touched me? And then this long conversation ensues, and he refuses to leave until this woman steps forward. Can you imagine what must be going through Jairus' mind at that point in time? The anxiety and the hurry that he must be feeling. I know how I feel when I'm just trying to get the kids out of the door to school on time in the morning. But this is a matter of life and death. But there's something that this father doesn't know. What he doesn't know is Jesus' proclamation in Revelation 22. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. What Jairus doesn't realize in this poor timing is that the one who made the world in time itself is not only the one who stands before him, but who occupies fully every point in time and space, not only occupying each moment, but holding it in existence. What Jairus doesn't know is what St. Paul will later, later tell to the Athenians, the God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. He is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. At that very moment where Jesus decided to take a break and give his full attention to this poor lady with this poor condition, Jairus didn't realize that at that very same moment, Jesus was in that bedroom with his dying daughter. Jesus was there holding her every second. Jesus was there every moment. That's why when I was looking for some cover art this week uh, for your bullet, go look at your bulletins. Isn't that a beautiful interpretation of this passage? And it's a very unique one too. As I was looking for cover art for this, I found all sorts of pictures of a stern Jesus with his hands over a dying girl commanding her back to life. And that would indeed be more faithful to the text. But when I saw this, I saw something that was very faithful to the heart of Jesus himself. What I saw here, and who knows, this may not even be a, temp, a chronological interpretation, because what I'm saying to you right now is that even before Jesus got into the room with the dead girl, he was already in the room with the dead girl, loving her, kissing her tenderly on the forehead, ready to call her back to life. Our timing is not always God's timing. But not only that, but when we find that we are in poor timing, what we see is our limitations and not God's limitlessness. And I would suggest to you today, my friends, that our faith is grounded in God's limitlessness and not in our limitations. Our faith is grounded in his ability to do, not our ability to see what needs to be done. And our faith is grounded in his limitlessness and not our limitations. Finally, not only did Jairus have the wrong question and the wrong timing, but he also had very much the wrong outcome. Jairus is a situation where everything went absolutely wrong, all the way it would seem to the very end. Our text tells us while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. No worse news could ever come to a father. His worst fears had come to pass. All of his anxieties that he had dealt with for every single day and week leading up to that moment, all the anxieties as he requested and begged Jesus to come, all the anxieties that build up as he was there in the crowd and as Jesus was having this conversation with this woman, all of them actually came to pass, and the worst happened. By every estimation, at that point, it seemed a hopeless cause. After all, the text says, why trouble the teacher any further? And who among us would not say a similar thing? And yet, even in the depths of despair, even while chained to the worst possible outcome, Jesus looks Jairus in the eyes and says, do not fear only believe. Jesus Christ walks into the worst possible moment of Jairus' life, and he speaks. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. The very word who spoke at creation speaks who set the stars burning and the world's turning with but the word of his mouth now speaks. 
the way, the truth, and the life, who breathed life into Adam, a lifeless lump of dirt, now walks into Jairus' darkest moment and breathes new hope to life. God knows no limitations. Even in the most impossible circumstances, God is faithful to Jairus, and God, in our worst circumstances, is faithful to us. Even when the worst happens, God is still God. God is still good. God is still in control. At the first moment of creation, he declared, let there be light, and light shined in the darkness. And no matter the darkness in your life, God can bring light out of the darkest moments. Allow him to speak into your darkness and let there be light. For our faith is not grounded in our circumstances, but finally in God's faithfulness. In the end, my friends, Jairus had the wrong questions. He had the wrong timing. He even had the wrong outcome. And yet in all of this, God proved faithful. Because our faith is grounded in God's ability to do, not our ability to know what needs to be done. Our faith is grounded in God's limitlessness, not our own limitations. And our faith is grounded in God's faithfulness, not in our circumstances. Do not fear, only believe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's pray for the church and for the world. Almighty and ever-living God, we are taught by your holy word to offer prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people. We humbly ask you mercifully to receive our prayers. Inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord. And grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love.
Lord, in your mercy. We pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the way of righteousness. And so guide and direct our leaders, especially Joe Biden, our president, that your people may enjoy the blessings of freedom and peace. Grant that our leaders may impartially administer justice, uphold integrity and truth, restrain wickedness and vice, and protect true religion and virtue. Lord, in your mercy. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests, and deacons, and especially to your servant, Steve Wood, our Archbishop, and to Andrew Williams, our Bishop, that by their life and teaching, they may proclaim your true and life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. And to all your people, give your heavenly grace, especially to this congregation, that with reverent and obedient hearts, we may hear and receive your holy word and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Prosper, we pray, all those who proclaim the gospel of your kingdom throughout the world, and strengthen us to fulfill your great commission, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all that you have commanded. Lord, in your mercy, we ask you in your goodness, O Lord, to comfort and sustain all who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in your mercy. We remember before you all your servants who have departed this life in your faith and fear, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we ask you to give us grace to follow the good examples of all your saints, that we may share with them in your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We repent of your sins and seek to live in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways. Draw near with faith and make your humble confession unto Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker and judge of us all, we acknowledge and lament our many sins and offenses which we have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your righteous anger against us. We are deeply sorry for these our transgressions. The burden of them is more than we can bear. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may evermore serve and please you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Please rise. <clears throat> Good morning, friends. If you're visiting uh, us here to this morning, we would be delighted if you'd scan our QR code in our bulletin and uh, just give us a chance to connect with you and get to know you. And for the rest of you, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Perform your vows to the Most High.
Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord. And of your Lord be the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right is right our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn, to proclaim the glory of your name. All praise and glory is yours, O God, our Heavenly Father, for in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and, su and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. And he instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. So now, O merciful Father, in your great goodness, we ask you to bless and sanctify with your word and Holy Spirit these gifts of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, 
in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. For on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my, bo- my blood of the new drink this all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of your dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we, your humble servants, celebrate and make here before your divine majesty with these holy gifts the memorial your Son commanded us to make, remembering his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and his promise to come again. And we earnestly desire your fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving asking you to grant that by the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may obtain forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice. We humbly pray that all who partake of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with your grace and heavenly benediction, and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us, and we in him. And although we are unworthy because of our many sins to offer you any sacrifice, yet we ask you to accept this duty and service we owe, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses, through Jesus Christ our Lord. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. Alleluia. 
We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercy. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given for you, because of your body and soul, to everlasting life. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, given for you, everlasting life. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you, because of your body and soul, to everlasting life. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given for you, because of your body and soul, to everlasting life. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given for you, because of your body and soul.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us through this sacrament of your favor and goodness towards us that we are true members of the mystical body of your Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of your everlasting kingdom. And we humbly ask you, Heavenly Father, to assist us with your grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all the good works that you have prepared for us to walk in, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.